believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with uh, drug addiction, alcohol, and other life issues. Uh, and shame. I shame. I shame. I was born May 1st, 1979 at the Air Force Academy Hospital in Colorado Springs, Colorado. My father, he was uh, in the Marine Corps, and then after a couple of tours in the Marines, he joined the Air Force um, where he had met my mother. And she was stationed, or he was stationed in Taipei, Taiwan during the Vietnam War. Uh, they got married, had three children, and <clears throat> then uh, my father was discharged from the Air Force. My parents moved back to Waterloo, Iowa. Uh, shortly after I started kindergarten, my mom got a phone call um, that her brother had died on his wedding night. And so she wanted to go back to Taiwan and go to the funeral. And uh, my mom told me that uh, my uncle had been, died in a tragic, terrible uh, motorcycle accident on their wedding night, and she said that she was gonna go back just to her brother's funeral. So soon after my mom returned to Taiwan, my parents got divorced. I found out over the phone. Um, at the time, my sister was four, my brother was two. Um, I do remember the day that she left like it was yesterday. Um, she had told me, she's like, Shane, I want you to watch over your little brother and watch over your little sister and, uh, you know, make sure that you love them and, and look after them. And that no matter what happens, be proud of who you are. Don't let anybody tell you that it's wrong to be Chinese American. You need to be proud of who you are no matter what your skin color looks like, no matter what your eyes look like, no matter what my skin tone looks like. <coughs> so she said... Uh, she loved me very much, that I'm special, I'm smart, I'm gonna do great things. Um, she said that you can do whatever you dream of if you just believe in yourself. And then, um, so that was kind of tough growing up with my mom uh, being gone. And so what happened was I would go to Taiwan at the end of the school year uh, for the summer and, and go and visit her then. So with her being 7,000 miles away, and growing up with my father, uh, my, my dad struggled very hard to get a job um, after the, the Vietnam War. Um, he didn't have a, like a, a college degree and stuff like that. And, and so I just remember him struggling a lot. We lived in poverty. It was uh, really unfortunate for him to struggle like that. Um, he didn't make very much money when he did work. He struggled to put food on the table. He struggled to pay the bills. We moved around a lot. We went from one place to the next. Uh, during my early childhood, my dad had a problem gambling. I never seen him very much. He would go to work and then gamble after work. We used to have the Greyhound dog track um, out here by Highway 63, and he basically lived there at night. And uh, many, many nights, he would have us hide in the trunk or hide in the back seat with blankets while he was inside gambling. And uh, I just remember the security guards would be flashing their flashlights at me as soon as they see me, I'd duck real quick, but they would catch us anyways and bring us in and call my dad and tell him, hey, don't you ever do that again. And you know, he, he, he probably did it like five times. But anyway, so at an early age, uh, my sister and I did all the cleaning, the laundry, the cooking, the dishes. I had to grow up really fast you know, with my mom not being around. Um, we barely had clothes to wear. I remember getting made fun of uh, in elementary school for the, the same pair of jeans I was wearing, the same pairs of uh, the clothes, the shirts. Uh, we got our food from the food bank. I remember government issued peanut butter, uh, bags of frozen bread, bags of mixed donuts, and I'd have to pull in there and reach out, and next thing you know, I had like nuts and different glaze and chocolate on it. I didn't care, I'd eat it anyways. But uh, I remember the, my dad would take us to the warehouse market to go get food, and I loved going there because we always got to sample free food there and stuff because uh, we were so poor. My dad would have us in line with coupons just to go buy toilet paper. We lived off of ramen noodles, hamburger helper, things I don't eat anymore. Um, Kool-Aid, lots of Kool-Aid, won't drink it anymore. Uh, canned foods, I, I get disgusted by canned foods now. 
Um, so if we were lucky, my dad would actually make spaghetti, and that was one of my favorite meals growing up. I love spaghetti, and he would make his famous stir fried rice uh, with hamburger. Christmas presents came from the Salvation Army. Um, clothes came from my uncle Fred. Um, I don't ever remember celebrating a birthday growing up. My dad's family didn't get along with each other. There was five brothers, and they seemed to have beef with each other and argue and spent many, many years not talking to each other. Um, they fought all the time. Our family never got together for holidays. We never went to church. I did not grow up in church at all. Uh, there was a lot of screaming and yelling. We had a very dysfunctional home. By the time I got to third grade, my dad got evicted from his house in Waterloo, and we had to move to Evansville. The kids made fun of me for being Chinese. I was the only minority in the school. They would say mean things to me. They would speak to me with their version of Chinese. They would make fun of me because of my clothes. They'd make fun of my shoes. I was made fun of for my skin color. I got made fun of for my slanted eyes. By the time I was eight years old, I was smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol. I started hanging out with other kids that got in trouble. By the time I got into fourth grade, I remember bringing a knife to school one day and I showed a kid and he told the, the teacher and I got expelled for, for bringing a weapon to school. Um, also in fourth grade, I got arrested for shoplifting baseball cards at the Prano gas station there in, uh, on Lafayette Street. I also got kicked out of the Evansdale School District uh, for getting into some fights, and my dad had to move back to Waterloo. He was really, really mad at me for getting kicked out of Evansdale. Um, I remember being grounded the whole summer for that. We had moved over by Crossroads Mall during my fifth grade year. I lived about a block away from Kitchell Elementary School. This was my third elementary school that I went to by the time I was 10. And there was this annex building next to Kittrell. I'm not sure if it's still there anymore, but I seen a hole in the brick wall outside, and I thought it would be a cool idea to put some leaves in there and start them on fire. The next thing I know, the fire department, the police department, the sheriffs, everybody was there. Thick smoke started billowing out of the, the building, and I was just like, oh man, I'm in trouble for that. Luckily, they were able to put the fire out and the building was, uh, was fine. I just damaged the one wall. Um, after that incident, I was placed on probation and I was in big trouble. So I had to do hundreds of hours of community service for that, picking up trash all over Waterloo. Um, I'm not exactly sh sure how I passed sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Uh, I was on probation throughout this whole time I know I had to do hundreds of hours of community service for car theft, vandalism, burglary, stealing, uh, assaults. I can go on and on about my juvenile record. It's pretty long. I can tell you that I drank a lot of alcohol, I smoked a lot of cigarettes, I smoked a lot of weed all through middle school. I only hung out with friends that drank or smoked. I didn't care about grades. I didn't care about my future. I didn't care about myself. I didn't care about my family. The only thing I cared about was just diluting the pain that I was going through every day, just numbing it. So by the time I got into uh, high school, the second day of high school, I got expelled for fighting. I knew I was going to get in trouble for my probation officer, so I ran away. I got hooked up with some gang members, and they took me in. So at the age of 13, I joined a gang. This was the first time in my life that I ever felt important. I felt like I was belonged to something. So I joined that gang and they taught me how to fight, they taught me how to sell drugs, they taught me how to shoot guns. I figured who needs any education when I can just sell drugs and have all the money in the world? I can just live life in the fast lane. By the time I was 16 years old, I had lots of so-called friends. I had cars, I had guns, clothes, jewelry. I had my own apartment. I was on top of the world. Having all these worldly possessions was meaningless. My life was a complete wreck. I started using meth, cocaine, LSD, weed every day. I tried every single drug that I could get my hands on. My life had gone completely unmanageable. 
My drug and alcohol addiction was getting out of control. I would drink a fifth of liquor every night plus a 12 pack. It only took four years of this lifestyle and I was arrested for selling drugs, assault, and burglary and was sentenced to prison for a total of 27 years at the age of 17. I remember going to jail, changing into my jail outfit. I was taken up to the general population where all the criminals were at. I was at a big jail, Blackhawk County, with a lot of inmates. People were in there for murder, robbery, theft, drugs. I went to my cell and closed the door. I remember feeling scared, lonely. I felt hopeless. I felt broken. I was a mess. I got myself into big trouble this time, and I knew I wasn't going to get out anytime soon. I looked around at my cell. There was a concrete slab, a thin mattress, real thin blanket. Toothbrush, toothpaste, a bar of soap, and half of a pencil. Looking over on the nightstand, I could see this book. It was a Gideon Bible sitting there. I remember it being blue. I picked it up. I turned to the only verse I knew. When I opened the book, it turned to the book of John, and it turned to John 3.16. A long time ago, when I was like six years old, the only time I ever went to church, my aunt had paid for me to go to a Bible camp. Lake, and this lady had talked to me about Jesus, and she shared with me that verse, and that was all I remember about church or Jesus. So when I read John 3, 16, it said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. After reading the first book of John that evening, I got down on my knees and I cried out to God and let it all out. All the pain, all the suffering, all the anger, all the guilt, all the shame, all the stuff that I had built up inside for all these years. I knew I was a sinner and I was convicted by God's word. I prayed to God asking for forgiveness for my sins that day. I cried out to Jesus to save me and show me the way. As soon as I repented from my sins, I remember this undescribable feeling inside that I've never felt before. It was the Holy Spirit. I felt peace, comfort, joy, love. This is something I never had before in my entire life. I realized God had loved me this whole time. And he was waiting for me to enter into his kingdom. I felt brand new. I felt born again. Jesus tells us in John chapter 7 verse 37, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Reading the Bible gave me strength, hope, and encouragement. I knew I was going to go to prison. I knew it was going to be one of the toughest challenges that I would ever face. <coughs> I learned that having a personal relationship with God was the only way I was going to get to do this time. I couldn't do it on my own. I had to admit to myself that I was a failure. My past life got me where I was at today. I had to let go of my past. I had to let go of all of my old friends and all of my old lifestyles and playgrounds. I had to make some sacrifices if I was going to make a change. By the grace of God, I survived going to four different prisons in six years. I was 17 at the time, and when I got out, I was 23 years old. I ended up getting my GED in jail, I took some college classes, signed up for carpentry school. I knew that selling drugs wasn't going to get me anywhere in life. And if I wanted to be successful, I'd have to get educated, learn a trade, get a job when I get out. If I wasn't working or lifting weights, I was studying the Bible with other Christians. I had a strong desire to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with other inmates and also to my family members back home. Inmates and family members were saved. Even though I was locked up and my freedom was taken away from me, I got to witness the power of God changing people's lives. I've seen prayers answered and miracles happen over and over. I knew if God would change my heart, he could change anybody's. I wish my story ended here, but it doesn't. My addiction to drugs brought me back to prison. Altogether, I ended up going to prison three times. I did six years of my life behind bars. I kept violating parole for not staying clean. Every time I got released, I would use more drugs and it got worse. I was stuck in this vicious cycle of criminal thinking and drug addiction. <coughs> I went through several drug treatment programs. 
I went through several 12-step programs to help me with my compulsive behaviors and life issues. The last time I was released from prison, it was 2004. I ended up starting my own business, A Plus Carpentry, in 2005. I was determined to be successful and not let my past define me. I was clean for about two years and then I relapsed. This time, I was intravenously using. I became addicted to meth. I couldn't stop. I didn't care anymore about my life. I just wanted to give up. I failed my parents. I failed God. I failed my daughter. I failed myself. This was the lowest point in my life. I'll never forget where I came from. I felt horrible inside. I was a complete mess. I was wrecked. I was disappointed with myself. I wanted to do good, but I just couldn't find the will to do it. My addiction had taken complete control over my life. I was powerless and my life was unmanageable. All that changed Friday, December 8, 2006. I was given some bad meth and I overdosed. My lungs collapsed. I was rushed to the hospital and I was in ICU on life support fighting to stay alive. The team of nurses and doctors didn't think I was gonna make it. They contacted my family and told them to come up that I might not live through this. I was in a coma for three days, and on December 10th, 2006, on Sunday morning, I woke up connected to all these tubes and IVs, and I knew God had saved my life. I knew God had a purpose for me. I shouldn't have, I should have died, I should have been dead. I've had so many near-death experiences, but this one, this time it was different. My father and my pastor were at the hospital praying for me. My dad had just recently accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. My dad told me he loved me for the first time in my life that I could ever remember. He said, son, I love you, and I wept. I had never seen him cry. He cried that day when he told me he loved me. My pastor told me he loved me. God told him that he was going to use me for his kingdom. Those words at that time, they were very powerful and miraculous at that time. They gave me encouragement. So waking up on that Sunday morning, I felt the presence of God with me. I thought about Jesus dying on the cross on Friday and how he rose from the dead on Sunday. His resurrection gave me a purpose to live. I was determined to stay drug-free and change my life around. I was determined to be a father and raise my daughter the right way. At the time that this happened, my daughter was three years old. I worked with DHS and proved myself to be a fit parent and gained custody of my daughter six months later. Today, by the grace of God and the power of Jesus Christ, I have been clean and I've overcome my addictions and I've found freedom in Christ Jesus. I started going back to AA for a while and then I went to NA where I led a meeting for about a year. Someone invited me to a Celebrate Recovery and I figured I would go and check it out. To my surprise, it was like NA, but even better. My higher power was Jesus and so was theirs. I could relate to the men leading the CR meeting. I started attending weekly and I went through a step study. By working the steps and the principles, I was able to have a deeper relationship with God and with others. I started attending, yeah. by working the steps and principles, I had a deeper relationship with God and others. God has restored my brokenness. He has healed my wounds. He has set me free. Praise God for being so good to me. I went back to school at the age of 30, and I graduated from Hawkeye Community College with an associate's degree. To this day, I'm a licensed construction contractor and handyman for almost 15 years now. I also work at the Cedar Falls Healthcare Center as the maintenance and environmental service director. I love to help other people, and I love to share my story of recovery with others. I am thankful to be a youth leader, to be a husband, and a father. Not a single day goes by that I don't thank God for saving me. While serving in my church for several years as a youth leader, my wife and I went through several years of Bible college. At the beginning of this year, God placed on our hearts to launch Celebrate Recovery in Waterloo, Iowa. Today, my okay. wife and I co-lead Celebrate Recovery on Monday nights. I am so grateful for Celebrate Recovery and for my forever family. Right now, my clean time is 12 and a half years. 
God's timing is perfect. His will is perfect. His grace is enough. God bless you all. Amen.